Friends, we're back. Uh, you know, Eustace, I can't remember a time in my life, and maybe in modern recorded history here, where we have seen more earth-shaking events and things happen at such a phenomenal rate. Then again, I wasn't around during World War II. I was born in 54. I wasn't around during the Great Depression. And those are times when a lot of things were fast-breaking, a lot of hearts were aching, and again you know it's always well things are going to be better we have a new paradigm we're moving to it's just the same old thing just revised revived and rolled out once again well you're absolutely on target uh, because uh, the fact is we're moving into a new period of history uh, we're just completed 25,000 years of a total solar orbit and now we're moving into uh, an acceleration of knowledge of power of energy uh, in other words, uh, the, the uh, people of the world are on the verge of a great adventure, which is just starting. And, of course, you haven't seen any evidence of this in the media. They know nothing about any of this because, of course, they know nothing about anything. <laughs> well, they, they, they seem to know when to keep their mouth shut and what not to say at the uh, right time or wrong time. You know, when you mentioned about... Uh, uh, the 25,000 years. Did, did you pick up on the story at all about the uh, uh, new comet that they have found? Uh... No, I, I saw something about it, not much. But uh, we're on a period of great discovery here, a discovery not only of our world but the universe. And uh, this is the most exciting thing. This is why I've been so optimistic over the years. People say to me, Eustace, you have endured everything anybody could endure in your 78 years, and yet you, you're more optimistic every day. I'm optimistic because I see God is unfolding the world before us, and uh, uh, it's up to us to take notice of it and to uh, benefit by it. I agree. And I see, I even though things look overwhelming and... Uh, how would I say the patriot cause looks underwhelming in some ways? The fact is, is that during times of great economic, social, or uh, fiscal chaos, folks, uh, the bottom line is, is that we have opportunities. It seems the elite they're always ready to seize it, but as Christians, I believe it's time we start applying the true principles of stewardship. And I don't know about taking the country back, but uh, doing what we should have been doing for a long time in the name of Christ, and then leaving it up to God whether or not he'll spare his hand to wrath on this nation. Well, it's not a question, really, of taking the country back. It's a question of stopping people from stealing it from us. That's what we need to do. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I totally agree. Totally agree. Well, your book, The Curse of Canaan, has had a very profound impact on a number of people I know, and... Uh, and it's a marvelous book, and I'd, I'd kind of like to, if we could, give it a little breakdown, go chapter through chapter, maybe during this short time that we have, two hours, we won't have the fullness of the opportunity to explore it uh, anywhere near the depth that, and, and the credit I'd like to give it, but I, I would like to go through it kind of chapter by chapter if you're amenable to that. Oh, definitely, and you know, the subtitle itself, A Demonology of History, uh, what it, it does is examine the demonic presence of uh, uh, demons in history. And, of course, people say, well, I have never seen any demons, but uh, there is a demonic presence. And what this book does, the, the, Curse of Trina, uh, the Curse of Canaan, traces the demonic presence and how it manifests itself through terrible catastrophes, war, wars, revolutions, uh, and so forth. All right, and, and and folks, that is the relevance of it. There is a there is an evil that is profound, and it's always been around. But it seems to be at its apex when things are oh, how would I say at their worst? And that's when Christians need to be shining, folks. That's when we really need to be at our brightest. And I think again, the information that uh, Eustace has uh, written and penned over the years, you're going to find very relevant. I'm praying these radio shows. Again, folks, make copies of them, give them away. I'm hoping Firefighters for Christ will give away another 50,000 copies of, of an interview I've done. That would be marvelous. Now, obviously, I don't have the finances to do that, and neither do you, but they do, and I'm hoping and praying again. We put a little pressure on them, contact them, and they'll get this information out. So, Well, the war against Shem. Now, there's a lot of discussion. There's a lot of confusion. There's a lot of disillusion. In regard to the movement of the tribes, uh, despite the excellent work of Arthur Kessler and others, you know, we, we have a whole lot of confusion going on. And the war against Shem, I think that that clearly defines and aligns 
what, why the world situations are as they are in terms of territories. Please give us a breakdown of that, if you would, sir. Well, the war of Hashem comes right from the, uh, Genesis 9.25, where uh, God cursed uh, Canaan. Cursed be Canaan, a slave of slaves shall he be to his brothers, Shem and Japheth. Well, because the Canaanites were condemned to be slaves of uh, the, the Semites, the Shem, the descendants of Shem, this is why the war against Shem goes on, because this is the slave rebellion of the Canaanites against the people of Shem. Well, now, when you say the, the slave rebellion, uh, and when you say Shem, now, who is Shem nowadays in modern terms? Well, Shem, uh, Shem is a uh, son, uh, Shem and Japheth were sons of Noah, and Canaan was Ham's son, who was the grandson of Noah, and it was the grandson, Canaan, who was cursed by uh, God because of transgressions. And uh, that's why he was cursed to be slaves. And uh, that, uh, from Genesis 9.25, is just as important today as it was when God made that curse many uh, centuries ago. Well, see, a lot of people look at Christ on the cross and they say, well, that starts a new covenant. Well, folks, that's true, but again, he didn't come to abolish, he came to fulfill. And that's the chill that I get down my spine because so many people are like, oh, we got a whole new gig going, the Old Testament isn't relevant. I submit to you folks, and I, I, I would uh, uh, like to get used to this reaction, it's as relevant as it ever was. Oh, well, Christ on the cross, you know, people do not understand what the significance of Christ is. That is not the defeat of Christ. This is the victory of Christ. And, in fact, uh, uh, the, the Bible says, if, and if ye be Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. So this is the promise, uh, the, the new covenant. I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. And this is... Uh, uh, this is the, it says, Behold, the days are coming, Jeremiah 31, 31. Uh, and this is what we have to look forward to. It's not, uh, we don't have to worry about the past. Or, or, or the, the, behold, the days are coming. This is where we are. Well, and, and that's interesting because, again, um, there, there's, a, there's a dichotomy going on in our society, and that is, is that uh, trying to define issues in the Middle East, I mean, folks, that, that place is so wacky and messed up, it's not funny. But I think the issues in the Middle East were all dependent and contingent upon where the curses were laid, where the promises were kept, where they were broken, and those promises that were immutable and irrefutable. Uh, are they conditional? Well, the bottom line is, folks, that whole thing in the Middle East goes down because no one kept their promise to God. Exactly. They did not fulfill the covenant. The covenant was there. And, you know, I mentioned in my book, uh, Curse of Canaan, uh, uh, my first revelation was that, quote, God has no secrets from man. You see, uh, God is not keeping secrets from man. Man is keeping secrets from God, and this is where the problem is. God is not hiding things from us. We're hiding things from each other for, uh, because of greed and uh, 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 trying to get ahead of other people and so forth. And uh, God has no part of that. And, and, and folks like you can hide from God, the all-knowing, all-seeing, all-present God of the universe, and, and yet we do because we now define God according to our own parameters. Uh, you heard of Jack in the Box, folks? We put God in a box. And because of that, because we put finite limitations on him, we think that we can manipulate, we believe that we can hide, and he'll never chide us for it. Oh, that's absolutely true. And you know what Jesus said? Uh, one of his uh, great admonitions was, Be not deceived. Be ye not deceived. And because we allow ourselves to be deceived, this is our vulnerability. Uh, we, we have to fight deception and expose deception. And, of course, that's what my work and your work is. And, and I think, folks, that that is a worthy, worthy enterprise, the most worthy enterprise, because that's what Christ asked us to do. Well, now, in regard to the transgression of Cain, uh, now, I, I think this is key because, folks, we see symbolism, we see occultism throughout the world today. And I think it's important that we understand the roots and the basis of that. And I believe transgression of Cain gives a lot of clear definition on that. Oh, it certainly does. And, in fact, I point out that all the conspiracies in history, especially during the last 5,000 years, uh, it's actually 
different aspects of the same conspiracy. Some people fix on one aspect of the conspiracy and say, this is the problem, and others say another thing. But the thing is, all the conspiracies work together. All the conspirators are part of the same operation, and this is what people uh, uh, find very reluctant. They want to fix on what they're looking for is the magic bullet or the silver bullet. If they can only find out which little group it is that's doing all the devilment, then uh, they can uh, figure out what's going on. Well, it's, it's not that easy because there's a lot going on, and it's a multifaceted operation. Yeah, it, it sure is, folks. And, and again, when you follow back the different conspiracies, when you follow back the different organizational aspects to it, you, you'll find, folks, all this is intertwined, overlap, and, again, some of the most monumental events in history comes when the two respective agendas, and I say two, folks, there, there are variants on that, but I like to break it down into two, when, when they get to a point, folks, where, where they have to stand off against each other, and that's when things get very interesting. Now, in regard, if you had to break it down, I know John Daniels, who's been a guest on the show, likes to break it down in current terms into two generic categories. One is English Freemasonry and French Freemasonry. I'd like to hear after the break how you break it down as to what's going on. Is it uh, pantheistic uh, atheism versus uh, socialistic uh, uh, capitalism? I mean, I I'd like to get Eustace's definitions. And if you have questions or comments, folks, you can email me now. We're not open the phones yet. At Bill at ProactiveNews.com. We'll be back in three minutes. Okay, friends, we're back. Bill Brumbaugh and Eustace Mullins. Uh, Eustace Mullins is the author of a number of brilliant books. The one we're talking about tonight is The Curse of Canaan. Folks, I'll be blunt with you on something, too. If you have any books in your library or reference materials, Eustace's books need to be the key of that. They need to be the center of that. And if somebody would like to get a hold of your books, Eustace, uh, get a, uh, a catalog or listing of them, I, I believe uh, we didn't have a chance to work together on this yet, but I, I would like to offer those at my website, proactivenews.com. But in the meantime, if they want to get them right away, how do they do that? Uh, through the Bankers Research Institute. Uh, which is at Box 1105, Stanton, Virginia, 24401. Okay, again, folks. Uh, Eustace, can you give that to us one more time, please? Yes, indeed. Uh, Bankers Research Institute, uh, Box 1105, Stanton, Virginia, 24401. All the books are available through that uh, number. Okay, great. Now, still in the transgression of Cain, I believe it was page 50 or 51 when you talk about the grand architect. Could you get into that a little bit for us? Because I think, again, Freemasonry is such a key issue to understand. Yeah, well, Freemasonry actually goes back to Nimrod. You see, Ham's uh, son, Canaan, had a son named Cush, and Cush had a uh, son named Nimrod. Nimrod became the first dictator of the world and a totally evil person who founded Freemasonry and built the uh, legendary Tower of Babel, of Babel in defiance of God's, will, of God's will. And because he did this, this became the rebellion against God, which has gone on to the present time. And uh, Nimrod had such tremendous power because Ham had stolen the garments which God made for Adam and Eve before he expelled them from the Garden of Eden. Cush inherited these garments from Ham and passed them on to Nimrod, who became the most powerful man in the world, the mighty hunter, because he had these garments. They gave him tremendous power. And it was because of this power and the use of this power that uh, Nimrod became the uh, dictator of the world, first, the first ruler of the world. And, and folks, and that's real important because all our Peggy and I have done uh, uh, programs on the power of some of the garments, and we've talked about the the robes. We've talked about different artifacts. There was real power in these things. Uh, oh, total power, yes. Yeah, and uh, you know we're not going to get into in depth and detail that uh, we have in the past. But the folks, is, folks, you need to realize 
that you need to understand this. Now, let me ask one quick question. Was this power technological, or was it, uh, oh, I hate to use, uh, I'll use the term supernatural. Uh, well, eventually, uh, uh, at first it was really physical power, uh, more power than other people had, but it really was uh, supernatural power. Okay. I, I, ju I just want to clarify that because I know two guys are going to send me emails asking me that question, so I, okay. I figured we'd just get it out of the way right now. I've, I've got a very well-educated audience. As a matter Good. of fact, I feel my radio audience is probably the finest educated radio audience in the world. So, and, and it's our goal and opportunity to get them as best educated as possible. Well, now, you also get into the different levels of Freemasonry, and I find that relevant and important, too. Could, could you give us a, a little dissertation on that, please? Uh, yeah, uh, Freemasonry originated as a world movement because Nimrod, even though he was the ruler of the world, was finally killed by uh, Shem, and Shem then uh, chopped his body up into small pieces in order to uh, lessen his power. And these pieces were uh, uh, hidden by the priests in, in the forest. And because they were hidden, uh, the people... The priests were the only ones who knew where the pieces of the body were buried, and this is the old saying, uh, he knows where the body is buried. And uh, that goes back to the origins of Freemasonry. Uh, the, the priests were the Gnostics, and the Gnostics knew where the pieces of the body were, and that's where their power came from. And this was the uh, how Freemasonry became a world power and has uh, continued to be a, a world power to the present day. And Gnosticism, boy, there's a subject for... Uh... Oh, Gnosticism, yes. <laughs> yeah, that, that, we, we can do an entire show on that. Oh, you certainly uh, could. Yeah, not, not to even scratch the surface. Well, Chapter 3, you talk about secular humanism, and I, I do find a relationship there, from my particular view, of Gnosticism and secular humanism. Can you take us through Chapter 3 a little bit, please? Yes, indeed. Well, secular humanism, uh, uh, people talk about secular humanism today, but they don't really know what it is. It's a transitional po power of Freemasonry, which went, as I say, after the uh, secret uh, hiding places of the bodies of Nimrod gave rise to Freemasonry as a world power. And, and uh, we'll, have, we'll have to break at that point. We do have a commercial coming up in eight seconds. Uh, I lost time on the clock. We'll be back in just a minute. This is GCN. What will you do without freedom? The Genesis Communications Radio Network. You know, Eustace, I'm so sorry to lead you right in for a break right as you're starting to float. Folks, we were going to have Eustace give us a uh, breakdown on his chapter 3 in his book of the Curse of Canaan, Secular Humanism, and I, I did that right before the break. I apologize, Eustace. Well, that's fine, all right. Uh, all right, we're back, my friend. Go ahead. Oh, well, Secular Humanism, uh, I found the formula for Secular Humanism, which, as I say, is the transitional period of uh, Freemasonry and uh, the descendants of Nimrod, and uh, I got it out of the Babylonian Talmud, of all places, uh, where uh, it was the will of Canaan. When Canaan died, he left instructions for his heirs as to how they should conduct their lives and, and their operations. And uh, uh, they said, five things did Canaan charge his sons. Love one another, that is, the criminals should love each other but hate everybody else. Love one another, love robbery, love lewdness, hate your masters, and do not speak the truth. Well, we saw that on television last night when uh, Connie Chung interviewed Gary Condit. <laughs> he followed every principle of that. And this is actually the, the uh, operating uh, instructions which politicians use in this country. They love robbery, love lewdness, hate your masters. They hate their masters because, of course, under the curse of Canaan, they were supposed to be slaves and do not speak the truth. And, of course, they never do. And... Uh, this is the code of secular humanism, and this is the way that uh, they control other people because law-abiding, Christian, uh, hard-working people find it impossible to believe that these Canaanites can live like this, that they can love robbery, love lewdness, hate your masters, and do not speak the truth because this is not the way ordinary people live. And so it gives them a freedom 
to carry on their criminal operations because uh, the average person cannot believe that people live like this. And, and that's the truth of it. it that, that is so far beyond us. But, folks, that is the way it is. Um, and I found Condit, it, again, uh, we just got through with Bill Clinton, and now we're getting the same thing from Condit. I'm really hoping it will do some severe damage to the Democratic Party. <laughs> And uh, maybe the Republicans... Well, they very well may. You know, he, they were going to rerun him, and now after his disastrous appearance, uh, I think they're having second thoughts. <laughs> well, hopefully they're having second, third, and fourth thoughts on that one. Oh, yes. Yeah, but uh, anyways, okay. Well, you know, one of the things I found about secular humanism, uh, being a formerly, uh, I was proud to be an atheist, even though everybody has some sort of belief system, uh, they have some sort of religion. It's incumbent in the nature of man, even if it's a religion and not believing in any religion. Uh, that, too, folks, is defined as a belief system. Uh, secular humanism left me without help. It left me without hope. And I do know that as I went through my life and dealing with some of the, the media people that I did, movie stars and others, you get to a point where you see these people that are at the pinnacle of their art or profession or on the rise up, and they're more shallow, they're more lost than anyone else you'll meet the rest of your entire life. Apart from a god, I believe I probably would be dead now because, frankly, I wouldn't have any reason to go on. Oh, yes. Oh, uh, it, it is a hopeless situation because they have to give up everything that anybody wants to believe in. And, in fact, secular humanism, which is now totally in charge of our education, wants you to give up honor and integrity and loyalty and uh, become like the Canaanites. Hate your masters, love lewdness, love robbery. And when that takes over the educational system, which it, we have seen it do, now, you know, all these schools in the United States were founded by Christians, including uh, Reverend John Harvard, Harvard University, which is now a... Uh, a cesspool of homosexuality and uh, uh, left-wing uh, insanity. Well, all these schools were founded by uh, Christians, but by the, the year uh, 1900, John Dewey and this crowd of secular humanism moved in and took over the entire educational system. And they banned honor and integrity and learning and uh, made it part of the uh, conspiracy. And, and folks, again... If there's no hope, if there's no rock-solid values on which to build your future, understand it all degenerates down into chaos. I think that that is really the conclusion I have from secular unionism. It will degenerate into chaos. Yes, indeed. Well, in Chapter 4, you discuss England. Now, I do a lot of discussing, or no, I should say discussing of England. Uh, I find them disgusting because although people around the world like to say, well, England is nothing more than America's satellite. It is absolutely the antithesis, folks. The United States is not too much more than a, a headless body getting its orders from Britain. Well, it does, but that's because uh, uh, the Freemasons, uh, uh, the uh, Duchy of Hanover, took over the throne of England in 1717 and set up Freemasonry as the ruling force in England, and we are directed by England because of Freemasonry. Now, most people think that England was the origin of the United States, but in fact, we rebelled against England. Fifty-two percent of the uh, inhabitants of the uh, United States were of German descent. And so, in World War One and World War II, our logical uh, predilection would have been to fight with Germany against England. But because of the Freemasonry, we were lured into coming in on England's side and fighting the Germans of the 52% of the uh, people of the United States. Now, that's interesting. I didn't know. Well, <laughs> the well Germany, uh, German yeah. were, were missed by one vote being the national language of the United States instead of England. Now, I missed by one vote? Oh, my goodness. One vote only because many of the uh, American settlers spoke German, and were from Germany, and uh, they wanted to, the uh, German as the national language of the United States after the Revolution. And it missed by one vote, and that's why we're speaking English today. Now, that is fascinating. I, again, prior to the information I received from you, I was not aware 
that uh, we have that many Germans. As a matter of fact, that's kind of a little-known thing in the history books. I, I don't find Oh, it isn't mentioned at all. And I knew it because I have many German friends in New York, and one of my best friends was George Sylvester Virick, who whose father was the uh, illegitimate son of Kaiser Wilhelm I. And because of that uh, family background, Sylvester became the leader of the German Americans of the United States in the 1920s and 30s, and he represented Germany uh, during both world wars. Uh, and, but he was uh, very incompetent. He was a poet and not a propagandist, and so. Uh, he was probably the real reason why we went in on the side of England uh, instead of Germany. Well, of course, now, when you say that, it conjures up images that uh, maybe we need to define a little bit because a lot of people might think, well, now, hold it, hold it, hold it. You're talking about uh, backing Hitler, right? Uh, well, uh, in, the, in the first uh, I, I war, know, I know, the I... Kaiser, and the Kaiser happened to be... Uh, so that's a very first cousin. Yeah, so no. you would have been backing the Kaiser, that's true. No, 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 and, and I, I was being facetious there. Oh, oh yeah. Hitler. No, we wouldn't Ka have been Ka backing Kaiser, Hitler, of course not. Yeah. No, Kaiser Wilhelm, though, uh, he was a very interesting man, and uh, I find that also fascinating, that the history books have almost completely eliminated any talk or any mention about Kaiser Wilhelm or what he was up to or his faith. Well, he was demonized by British propagandists during World War I, and uh, it was so successful that I don't think Kaiser Wilhelm ever regained uh, his uh, status as a world leader and, to and, this day. Yeah, and now the nature of that was, uh, now wasn't he a bit rebellious towards the forces of Freemasonry, Kaiser Wilhelm? Oh, he was indeed, and Hitler was too, by the way. Hitler banned Freemasonry and uh, the Nazis and the court. Uh, and the Nazi uh, regime, and of course that's another reason that uh, he's demonized again today because he, uh, I, I think he closed down, and Mussolini closed down the Freemason lodges in Italy also. So this made them the enemy. Well now, so that, that raises some questions there. Now I know, I've read Douglas Reed's work, and uh, folks, Douglas Reed was a, I'm going to get this wrong, I believe a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist or I should say photojournalist, when he was with the uh, London Times, wasn't he? Uh, yes, Douglas Reed was one of the preeminent journalists of the world uh, during his period. He's totally forgotten now. Of course, he's been blacked out, actually. But his books are very powerful. Hmm. They sure are. As a matter of fact, though, I think many or most of them are no longer available here in the United States. Uh, I think that that is part of the stuff that's hit the banned book list. Oh, it is, and that's why they're available through rare book dealers. That's about the only place you can find them. Hmm. And, yeah, no, as a matter of fact, I was trying to bid on uh, one of his books in California. It was a second edition book, and the guy wanted an outrageous amount of money for it, and I was trying to act as a broker for another guy to pick it up, but they just wanted too much. And they didn't care what was in it. It was just that they knew the book had been banned and they knew it had some value. Well, well they knew it was in demand. That was the thing that was that it's scarce, it's rare. Yeah, and, uh, and I, we should probably back off of that subject for now to stay chronological and get to, we talked about England a little bit. Now, what about the French Revolution? Because, again, history kind of is sketchy on the French Revolution, and those of us that are a little bit more intimate on what actually happened, you know, that was a major deal, in my opinion, the French Revolution. It definitely was one of the most manipulative revolutions in history. Oh, it certainly was. Well, uh, both the rebellion against the Kaiser, or the war against the Kaiser, and the war against uh, the, uh, the French king and uh, the French Revolution were part of the war against the Semites, the descendants of Shem. And uh, both of those, of course, both of those aristocracies were wiped out. Well, yeah, and, and basically, again, through the forces of masonry tied in with the international bankers, correct? Yes, and in, of course, you, in uh, the French Revolution, you had a concerted effort to exterminate uh, uh, the descendants of Shem and the French aristocracy. Well, <sighs> but they called it liberty, equality, and fraternity, and liberty, equality, and fraternity was simply a code word for wiping out the descendants of Shem. What? 
Yeah, and the manipulation that went on was rather interesting. I mean, I, I believe at one time during the French Revolution, didn't the peasants storm the, the, the palace and the king came out by himself, talked to him and said, what's your problem? I mean, you know, uh, I'm a good king, and haven't I done this and that? And they actually walked away and backed down? Oh, yes, because uh, he had been a good king. But later on, in the French Revolution, this is a very little known fact, the principal victims of the French Revolution were not the aristocracy, they were the peasants. Uh, the peasants were massacred because after the Jacobins, or the Rothschild agent, uh, took over, uh, they, they, they executed uh, King Louis and uh, Marie Antoinette, and they took over the country, and then they began to exterminate the peasants because they did the same thing that Stalin did in the 1930s in Russia. They exterminated the peasants because the peasants wouldn't turn all over all, the, all their grain uh, to these criminals that took over the country. Mm. And the peasants, uh, the, uh, the amount of uh, aristocrats uh, killed in France was very small uh, compared to the massacres of the peasants, which were hundreds of thousands of people. Well, you won't, you won't read that in any history book either. <laughs> no, no, I, you, you don't. And, and I was a bit of a student of history, too. Of course, it was PC history, politically correct history. Uh, so, uh, again, very interesting. Well, we go for the French Revolution, and I know that uh, uh, we had, uh, there was a lot of sympathy, supposedly, from France in regard to the American Revolution that took place over here. And, you know, I always wonder the nature of that sympathy. I mean, you know, you get through having your revolution and you got all sorts of stuff going on and then all of a sudden your buddies or you want to uh, help out America. It just didn't seem right to me. You think they want to kick back and pick up the pieces of their own country and, and yet again, I've, I've heard there was sympathy from the French towards the Americans. I always felt that that was kind of a, uh, a veil and there was some other agenda why the French were so eager to help the Americans. Oh, there was, because our principal representative in France who helped set that up was Benjamin Franklin, who was a leading uh, Freemason. And it was uh, Franklin's influence with the Freemasons in France which brought about the support of uh, uh, the Americans uh, in their war against England. And, and, of course, England was a Freemason country also, but you had uh, the French Freemasons and the English Freemasons were at that time sort of... Uh, uh, rivals because the Grand Orient was in uh, uh, France, uh, the Grand Orient Lodges, and they were rivals of the York Rite of Freemasonry, which is in England. And it was that rivalry which really led to the uh, uh, colonists winning the war, uh, the revolution, in, in uh, the 1780s. Hmm. Very interesting, very interesting. Uh, again, folks, I guarantee you won't hear any of that in a history book. Not a, not a uh, word of it, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, now the Civil War. Uh, let's get into the Civil War a bit. What, what were the circumstances behind that, please? The real circumstances. Well, the, 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 the real Civil War, uh, the, the circumstances of the Civil War originated because the Rothschilds decided that America was growing too fast and becoming too powerful as a world power. And so they decided to split it into two smaller countries to balkanize it, and they did this through the issue of slavery. Uh, they set up the abolitionist movement in New England, uh, and the bankers there spent millions of dollars to uh, uh, promote abolition or the uh, freeing of the slaves. And uh, But uh, in order to have the Civil War, they had to create a southern army. There was no army of the southern states. In other words, we only had the United States Army in, in Washington, D.C., based in Washington, D.C. So uh, the Rothschilds spent millions of dollars sending uh, uh, Freemasons through the South in order to organize uh, local hunting clubs and shooting clubs, which became the basis of the Confederate Army. And this was all done from Cincinnati by the Knights of the Golden Circle, which was the branch of the Illuminati, which set up the whole Civil War. In other words, we would never have had a Civil War because you cannot have a, a, a war when only one side has an army. So the Knights of the Golden Circle out of Cincinnati traveled through the South for 18 years, setting up uh, paramilitary groups uh, throughout all the southern states, and that, that became the Confederate Army. 
Mm. Uh, so I, I keep seeing the hand of Freemasonry, which, again, uh, that, that's simply the modern delineation, isn't it? It wasn't always known as Freemasonry, was no, it? No, it wasn't. Uh, it uh, it, uh, it uh, came under various guises. Well, Masonry itself, you know, was actually the builder's trade during the Middle Ages, and these people were builders. They were stonemasons and carpenters, but then uh, it took on uh, a mystical aspect through what they call speculative uh, Freemasonry, and speculative Freemasonry was no longer builders and carpenters, but they were uh, teachers and intellectuals and and revolutionaries and so forth. In other words, Masonry went, underwent a tr tremendous transformation when the uh, House of Hanover took over the British throne in uh, 1700. Mm. Well, we're going to hold it right there, and board off, I need to talk to you too, if I if I could. We'll be back in just a couple minutes. You know, friends, there's so many fascinating facts about the American Revolution. I, I find it amazing. I, I believe the British had, in Georgetown, several thousand troops stationed for an extended period of time after we allegedly won the Revolutionary War. Well, I think so. And also, the judges of the United States continued, after we won the Revolutionary War, they continued, the judges in our courts continued to rule in favor of the English. Uh, in other words, all, all of the uh, loans and mortgages that... Uh, the Bank of England and uh, British uh, lords had over the American people, the judges upheld that they had to be paid in full. So and that's I, a little just, known fact of history also. Yeah, I'm just wondering if we really did win the war because it seems like financially we lost, and we lost big time. We lost big time, and they set up the first bank of the United States. The first central bank of the United States was set up in 1787 at the very time that we were uh, establishing our Constitution. Now, that's interesting. Uh, I was not aware of that. Well, Thomas Jefferson opposed it, uh, but George Washington, who was the, then the president, and, George, and Thomas Jefferson was Secretary of State, uh, Jefferson bitterly opposed it, but Washington agreed and signed the charter of the First Bank of the United States. But when that uh, uh, expired in 1812, Jefferson was the president, and he refused to renew it. And this is why the British attacked the United States again. And the, the only reason in the history books for the War of 1812 is that Jefferson refused to re renew the charter of the Central Bank, the first bank of the United States. And you won't find that in any history book either. No, as a matter of fact, you don't find hardly anything about the War of 1812. Oh, uh, no, outside because of the they won't tell you why it started. It started because Jefferson refused to renew the charter of the first bank of the United States. And you won't find that at Harvard, you won't find it at Yale, or you, you won't find it at Princeton. Uh, your children can go there and you can spend all the money getting an education, and they won't hear one word about the true history. I really have to write the history of the United States because it, it is a, all the wars are bankers' wars, and all of the government operations are the conspiracies of the international bankers. Yeah, I was going to say about the only thing I remember from 1812 prior to being educated and motivated as an adult was a uh, very dynamic piece written by Peter Ilyich Tchaikovsky. Oh, uh, yes, the 1812 Overture. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was about it. Uh, interesting. And, folks, uh, again, again, the Civil War now, I mean, I mean, the War of 1812. Now, how much influence did that have in the Civil War? I mean... Folks, wars are preluded by wars. They're segues. They're bridges into the next war. I mean, and, and that's where we, we we're going next, the Civil War, the bloodiest, most costly war in U.S. history, and a war that neither side won. Oh, no, no, but everybody lost because the bloodletting in this country was terrible. And uh, it, it was the greatest bloodletting uh, per capita of any country in the world. It was a massacre on both sides. Mm. Well, at Gettysburg alone, uh, Lee continued to send uh, the Confederate troops up against uh, the pickets charge and so forth 
when the union had already overwhelmingly established uh, the control of the uh, of the uh, bluffs and hills around Gettysburg, and uh, Lee simply wiped out the Southern Army right there in Gettysburg. Now that was weird. That was almost like a setup. I was sitting there thinking. It, it, it seemed very strange. Yeah. Yeah, Lee Lee was not a dummy. I mean, he was a very competent military man, and yet, folks, again, you tell your people to go do something stupid. I, you got to wonder, was he, which side was he working for? And we're going to pick it up at the top of the hour. We've got a minute and a half break for Station ID. We'll be back right at the top. Again, this is Bill Brumbaum, I guess Eustace Mullins. We're going through his book, The Curse of Canaan. Now, well, in regard to the title of the book, how does the Civil War fit in with that, Eustace? Well, as I say, the Rothschilds decided in 1838 to split the country into two uh, uh, smaller balkanized countries. And when Lincoln fired on, uh, when, when Lincoln uh, was... Uh, was supposedly defending uh, the, the Federal Republic against the South because the South fired on Fort Sumter. Now that was all a setup because Charleston, South Carolina, was the headquarters of the Scottish Rite in the, the United States. And uh, it was the most Masonic city in the United States. And this uh, attack on Fort Sumter was uh, entirely organized by Freemasons in Charleston, which gave Lincoln the pretext to declare war on the South. You know, the Southern states were not looking for war. They had peacefully seceded from the Union, as they were entitled to do under the provisions of the Constitution. There was absolutely no reason for a war, and Lincoln himself uh, forced the war on the United States. Well, now, now that's interesting, because, again, now that's a perspective that is not often shared on the air. I, I keep seeing the same scenario. It's almost as if everybody is playing each other, that it's one big cosmic play going on, and the actors and actresses have ad-lib uh, capabilities within certain parameters, but basically they're acting almost according to script. They really are, and the script is written by the conspirators. As I say, the people in the North and the people in the South were not particularly... Uh, anxious to have war. You know, wars are very hard to start. It takes a lot of organizing and conspiracy to start a war and get millions of people to kill each other. You know, they had the, uh, uh, during the Civil War in New York City, they had the uh, riots against uh, conscription and uh, hundreds of people were killed because uh, the North, uh, the Northern people are not as crazy about uh, continuing the war against the South. And that's also not, not very well uh, covered in history. Yeah, I have only heard that a couple times in my entire research career, that hundreds of people were, were killed in, in uh, protests against forced conscription. All oh, the Civil War riots in New York and uh, Chicago were tremendous, well, uh, and, but that's been passed over by the historians. Well, and conscription was very unpopular, folks. Let's not forget that the British were conscripted conscripting our people where they could during uh, the Revolutionary War. Oh, they certainly were, yes. And, and th that was a real unpopular thing. And believe me, folks, believe me, that hung very high in the eyes of the people of this country. They didn't like the Brits doing it, and they sure as heck didn't like the North doing it either. No, indeed. Now, the South, they weren't working off of forced conscription, were they? Uh, no, but you see, they fought because they were invaded. Uh, you see, the South did not invade the North. The North invaded the South. So the people there were defending their homes against invasion, which gave them uh, the will to fight. And that's another one of those little interesting things that is conveniently left out of the history books as well. Oh, it because, certainly is. Yeah. Folks, that's very relevant. The fact is the South should have been allowed to secede. Why? It's a business. They pulled out of a business partnership. And it, yeah, I don't see it any more clear-cut or plain than that. No, that's exactly what it was. And, you know, the South actually won the Civil War. They won at the Battle of Manassas. And Washington was totally unprotected. 
And General Lee could have marched into Washington at any time, and the Civil War would have been over, but he didn't do it, because my feeling is that uh, Lee was always, at his heart, loyal not to the Union, but to the United States, and that he simply did not have it in him to conquer Washington. Do you know that under Lee's leadership, not a, uh, no Confederate soldier ever fired a, a shot against the city of Washington? Not one. That, that's rather odd, folks. Uh, it's rather odd because they, they won the Battle of Manassas 25 miles from the city of Washington, and they could have walked in there and took it, took it over that same afternoon. They did nothing. Yeah, that's right. Manassas was so important. Washington had thrown any defense or troops into that defense. Oh, yes. Defense. They were totally wiped out, and they had no defense whatsoever. And it's break time. We don't have a defense for that either. We'll be right back. Rumbaugh Yusuf Mullins, we're talking about the Civil War, some of the ramifications of it, and folks, we're giving you the most epidermal, superficial uh, tour we can of this excellent book, The Curse of Canaan, because frankly, you would take weeks and weeks and weeks, uh, even to mildly get into depth as to what the book's about, but I pray we're giving you enough fascinating material to get you folks out there to try and purchase the book, folks, uh, and again, get a list of his other excellent books. These, these are books, folks, that are weapons more powerful than anything we can carry, anything we can bury. The fact is, is that information like this can change this nation, folks, by educating our children in realities and, uh, and, 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 and giving them better direction than what we had. I mean, I was just you know, going through school, accepting ad hoc what the teachers taught me. And the fact is, folks, that is the agenda. They control the education. They control the nation. Eustace, other things about the Civil War and, and actually even going back before that, America was, was a country that, you know, we didn't want to be in a feudal society. We didn't want to have the rich elite to crush us beneath their feet. And... Yet something started happening out of that, and that was that uh, in addition to the influence of the secret societies, we have a neo-feudal country being formed because it starts turning out that the sons and daughters of the people that were kind of controlling and messing things up started basically assuming, although they were not officially referred to as titles of nobility, they started inheriting a lot of the duties and a lot of the things that their, that their forerunners had been doing, uh, that their fathers and, and, and grandfathers had been doing, to the point today where I, I see a complete and total neo-feudal society where, you know, we have, uh, again, we've got another Bush in the White House. And who's Clinton? Clinton is a Rockefeller. Why is he a Rockefeller? folks because the Rockefellers don't want to reveal themselves as being in that much control sitting in the number one seat in the nation they, they the country's not ready for you so they work through shills they work through their bastard lineage and and this has been going on for a long time now and I think the the American uh, the, the Civil War though we started seeing a full more full and direct manifestation of that oh we certainly do and these are family dynasties and the interesting thing is that these elitists, these family dynasties, arose in a country whose constitution says that every citizen has equal rights, that no citizen can set himself up above another one, and yet these elites uh, rose up and took over the country. And uh, they did it in the Civil War, by the way. Uh, the elitists did not go to war during the Civil War. You were able to pay $200 and send a substitute uh, to fight uh, for your place in the North when you were drafted, uh, uh, you could. And so none of the uh, wealthy families fought in the Civil War. They they uh, simply bought substitutes. J. P. Morgan and all of them. Uh, they spent their. Uh, J. P. Morgan got his uh, start as a financier by buying some condemned rifles from the uh, uh, Union Army and then reselling them back to the. Uh, uh, War Department at an inflated price, and the, the rifles didn't even work. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I'm not sure which is worse, uh, the Kennedy family or the Morgans on that one. I mean, you well, know, they're you unfortunately know. about the same kind, kind of people, but they definitely are elitists, and they definitely set themselves over above everyone else, 
And in fact, they just announced that Teddy Kennedy is uh, pretty well dead of uh, advanced cirrhosis of the liver because of his depraved lifestyle. He's only 69 years old, but uh, he's supposed to be in a very advanced stage of cirrhosis. And so, uh, and uh, if he happens to die now, uh, the Republican governor of Massachusetts will appoint a governor, and this will reinstate the Republicans as the majority power uh, in the Senate. Very, yeah, I, that, that's interesting. That's very interesting. Um, and, and I know that uh, Ted Kennedy, uh, well, you know, we can almost spend a little time on Kennedy tonight if you want as soon as we get through the evolution of this because we had, I, I, quite frankly, I had a really interesting time talking to you on the subject of Kennedy earlier. But uh, let's continue on right now with the book, and maybe we can get to Kennedy, and I guarantee we're going to have a handful of people that are going to want to call in and talk to you too, Eustace. Uh, the next chapter in the book, The State of Virginia. Now, I plead ignorant on the state of Virginia. I really don't know why the significance would be ascribed to the state of Virginia, but frankly, given the uh, meritorious import that you've given us on all these other chapters, it must have some relevance. Oh, it really does. Well, Virginia was known as the mother of presidents because the early presidents of the United States were mostly from Virginia. And uh, as the mother of presidents and the cradle of democracy, uh, Virginia played a, an inordinate role in the first hundred years of this uh, country. But you see, after the Civil War, we had a punitive uh, uh, government installed in Washington, uh, the federal government, and they maintained martial law in the southern states for uh, 12 years, from 1865 to 1877. And during that time, uh, they installed, under martial law, carpetbagger governments in all the southern states. So the southern states have never really recovered from these criminal governments which were installed under martial law. And in fact, uh, in, this, in the state of Virginia where I live now, uh, we have two parties. We have the Democrats and the Republicans. And uh, they're about the same. And I call them the carpetbaggers and the scalawags. The carpetbaggers are the Republicans and the scalawags are the Democrats. And uh, uh, that's the government that we have in the state today. Now, now, prior to uh, the, the the Civil War, was uh, Virginia just one big happy state, or was it broken down into two like it is now, Virginia and West? Well, indeed, oh, Virginia had a, a marvelous government up till uh, 1860. Uh, they produced a great statesman, and uh, they had a very homogenous uh, political establishment. And uh, there were there was no two party system in. Uh, Virginia up till 1860. Very interesting. Very interesting. Uh, well, I, I know the next chapter of the book, and I know we're going to have folks. I'll go ahead and give out the phone number now if you'd like to line up your calls. 1-800-259-5791. 800-259-5791. It would be nice to also to get some new faces and some new voices calling in. So again, that number is 1-800-259-5791. Obviously, we're not going to turn away phone calls, folks, but I, I, I would like to hear some of the new folks. And I know we expand this broadcast audience in, in leaps and bounds, and I, I like to hear some of you. You don't even necessarily have to agree with us, folks. I mean, discussion and disagreement can be very productive and very practical when it's done in a point-counterpoint format. So give us a call, 1-800-259-5791. Now, the World Wars, you and I kind of went over that last week quite a bit. Again, it's about banking and the fact that they're banking on the public's ignorance in regard to the real cause and causative agents involved in a war. Well, that's true, and you know, no historian has ever presented a plausible reason why World War I occurred or why World War II occurred. And I'm in this work today because I met a political prisoner, Ezra Pound, who became curious about the origins of World War I after so many of his young friends, writers and artists in, in uh, London and Paris, died in World War I, and he, wanted, he decided to find out what was the reason they died? What did they die for? And he found out that they died because the international bankers needed a war to create debt. Wars create more debt than anything else. And when they create debt, uh, then everybody has to pay interest to the bankers. And this was the only reason for World War I. And, of course, World War II was simply a rerun of World War I. Same, same parties, same reasons, everything right down the line. 
Well, now, I and, and folks, to, to get a grip or perspective on the monies that were involved and the tremendous interest and everything, it takes, I, I believe, to pay off the uh, Civil War, it took over 100 years for us to repay those loans. Or correct oh, yes, loans. it did. Uh, tremendous debt. And uh, the succeeding generations don't even realize that they're working to pay the interest and some of the principal on the wars, which happened hundred uh, many decades before they were even born. Folks, do you understand? I mean, that is indentured servitude at a, at, I mean, I'll take it a step further. That's bond servitude, folks. Because That's bondage. When we That's don't bondage. Stand, yeah, when we don't stand against it, that means we're accepting it tacitly, folks. We're not to do that. My Bible says I'm a bond. If, if indeed I surrender my life to the Most High God, I am a bond servant of His. You can't serve two masters. What do you think, folks? You go to one master and say, hey, I'm your loyal, good, and faithful servant. Then you go to the other and say the same thing. Don't you understand that both masters are going to be a little bit unhappy with you? I mean, sometimes I just wonder if people understand, again, that's getting caught between the proverbial frying pan and the fire. I don't think, uh, you know, if, I, if I'm going to be a Satanist, I'm going to be the best Satanist I can. I'm not going to dilly-dally around uh, and uh, try and jump back and forth and, well, let, let me be a Christian today and a Satanist tomorrow. Conversely, folks, when we serve the Most High God, the most worthy and just cause in existence, Given the fact that he has already accepted the burden for all of our sins on the cross, don't you think it makes sense that we need to apply ourselves as fully as humanly, respectively, humanly able? I mean, it's only logical, folks. Uh, a few years here with an eternity with the Most High God, I think I like the eternity with the Most High God better than uh, a quick passage south to hell. Well... Your chapter 10, your chapter 10, you get into the menace of communism. And again, folks, if you'd like to call in, 1-800-259-5791, 800-259-5791. You get into the menace of communism, and I know we've got a break coming up here in 15 seconds. We'll start getting some music. I'd like to pick it up at that point if we could. Okay, Eustace? Yes, indeed. All right. Well, folks, again, it is break time. Hang in there. We've got a lot more to share here on the air, a lot more of which we feel you need to be made aware. We'll be right back. Brumbaugh, Eustace Mullins, uh, we've got a caller, we've got an email message or two, and again, folks, if you'd like to get on the, the phones with us, 1-800-259-5791. Usually, Eustace, I don't open the phone lines until the last half hour of the show, we're approaching that, and I know that, again, there's a lot of folks out there that have a lot of questions. The menace to communism, Commun communism, I mean, that was a big red menace, it's all over, right? The bear choked and died, or... The menace of communism, what does it really mean? Well, you know, when I got out of the uh, Air Force in uh, 1946, I became a very dedicated anti-communist, and it took me 20 years to find out that by studying the Federal Reserve System that the Federal Reserve System was the backer of communism. Our Federal Reserve System here in the United States, principally the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, which is the Money Center Bank, was the, almost the sole backer of uh, the, common, the World Communist Movement. And that was a great shock to me. And I found out later that uh, <coughs> the United States government had been the sole backer of communism since 1917 when President Woodrow Wilson took uh, $20 million of his $100 million special war fund to prosecute World War I, which was voted down by Congress, of this World War I fund to prosecute the war, he took $20 million and sent his Secretary of State, Elihu Root, to Russia in 1917 to rescue the Bolshevik Revolution, which was uh, collapsing. And we have supported uh, 
the Russians ever since. All during the Cold, 40 years of the Cold War, we were keeping Russia alive. The Russian economy had collapsed. But we weren't allowed to know that because the Central Intelligence Agency, our supposedly spy agency in Washington, its sole function during the Cold War was to continue warning the American people about the menace of communism, that Russia was going to take over the world, and at the same time we were the sole support of Russia. That was to keep the military-industrial complex uh, uh, running this country. Well, I, and I guess if you don't have a boogeyman, there's no reason to be afraid of the night. Well, it's like Senator Vandenberg said. Uh, he uh, uh, told his fellow senators, and I have it quoted, uh, he said, the only way we can keep this going is to scare the hell out of the American people. And so the menace of communism uh, was promoted by the Central Intelligence Agency for 40 years and kept the uh, Cold War going when uh, there was no Cold War and the Russians were barely able to feed themselves, much less uh, fight us. Mm. And, and again, folks, that was another control factor. Why did we just help the military? Well, the same reason Saddam Hussein got that bolstering, folks, is because, again, the people are easily controlled through food, folks. So if we're, if, if, if we're supplying arms, if we're supplying technology to the respective countries, that country then controls the people itself, thus making it look like these dictatorships are so powerful, so strong, they're so evil, but folks are only evil because we feed the beast. Well, we, we feed them because uh, the United States today is still the greatest producer in the world, and uh, nobody can really do have any political movement anywhere. When we fought, the last people we fought were uh, Saddam's uh, Iraq uh, army in uh, 1990, and uh, we had President Bush, and uh, Saddam Hussein was... Uh, President Bush's partner in the Harkin Oil Company, and here he is denouncing his business partner as the new Hitler and declaring war against him, and uh, they were in business together. Well, now that whole thing was interesting. Plus, I mean, they had a business partnership, too, in regard to the Denver International Airport. Oh, they and, certainly did, yes. Yeah, and so, folks, again, it's just a big global play. It's the, the old quote, all the world's a stage and we're only players, folks. We're not just players. We're being played left and right. And because we don't fight the good fight, this keeps going on and on and on. These are the Energizer bunnies, folks. They never run out of this energy. They just keep going on and on and on. Folks, that's why programs like this, I pray, are important, should be important to you, that our homeschooling parents will utilize the opportunity to access our Internet archives or, or folks, to uh, make it uh, part of their uh, uh, program where they just tape the show every night and get the education in the hands of the kids, folks, because this is not airy-fairy stuff. This is documented. It is cemented in the blood of the people who have died, allegedly in the name of justice and freedom in this country, too often the need for greed by elitist bankers. Well, Eustace, uh, let's... Get to the phone lines if we could. Oh, certainly. And we'll do that. I think we'll wait till after the break. Uh, we'll get to you, Kate, real quick. We'll get to Ken and Gary. Uh, you said an interesting perspective and question on the Internet. We'll get to you as well, folks. Get them lined up. 1-800-259-5791. 5791 We'll be right back. This is GPN. The Genesis Communications Radio Network. Okay, folks, we're back. Bill Brumbaugh, your host of the Proactive News, my guest. Eustace Mullins, we've got some callers on the line. Let's get to the first caller, Kate from New Jersey. Good evening, Kate. Uh, good evening, Mr. Brimball and uh, Mr. Eustace Mullins. Good evening. Uh, Mr. Mullins, I must tell you, I have most of your books. The only one I think I don't have is about Christ, which you have said it's hard to get. Is that still uh, in print? It's out of print right now. I'm, I'm trying to reprint it now. Uh -huh. But the most marvelous is your monograph, 
And the best monograph that I am reading at this present moment is called The Secret Holocaust. And I believe that the truth is in this book, and that is why we have the horrible genocide the world over. And I think this book is more important than any of your books, Mr. Mullins. And I really appreciate your information, and the truth should be told. And God bless you. Thank you. Well, that was a good testimony. Uh, thank you very much, Kate. Uh, when you're talking the Holocaust, now that brings up a number of different possibilities. Are we talking the loss of human life through abortion, or do we get back to the official political designation of what the Holocaust is? And again, uh, I do not believe, and here we go, uh, are we ready? Are you listening, ACLU? I don't believe that there are historic records, factual records, that can document the death of six million Jews in Europe at that time. I believe that number to be greatly inflated. It doesn't mean the death or loss of a few hundred thousand people is not a horrible event, but the nature of the circumstances, folks, that's where history has been omitted. Well, The Secret Holocaust is one of our most popular books. And uh, which is also out of print right now. And, and uh, one I have, it's one I'm not familiar with too. So the secret Holocaust is the war against the Christianity, a worldwide war against Christianity, not the war against Jews, but the war against Christianity. And this is why the Anti Defamation League calls me a Holocaust denier, because <clears throat> my book, The Secret Holocaust does not mention the Holocaust against the Jews at all, and they claim because I don't mention it, that means I'm a Holocaust denier. <laughs> How you can deny something that I mentioned it, I don't know. <laughs> uh, that which is real interesting. Uh, well, you know, and the Holocaust against Christians, I mean, a lot of people are not really cognizant of how many people died, how many Christians died after the Bolshevik Revolution and through Lenin and Marx and Khrushchev. And, and then the Spanish Civil War, the, that was a war against Christianity. And also the uh, French Revolution was a war against Christianity. They massacred priests and nuns all over the France. Hmm. And, uh, and and then again, in the classic uh, Machiavellian, or maybe I should say Gramsci uh, scenario, the very implementers of the revolution were themselves uh, put under the knife, too, weren't they? Oh, they were indeed. That's, uh, that's where they said the terror devoured its own. That's which is, uh, There's a lot of famous sayings about the French Revolution, and one of them is that Robespierre and many of the others were devoured by their own uh, uh, mechanism. And, 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 folks, if you don't understand the relevance of that, let's put it in modern terms. There has been a recent revolution in this country. It has been a sexual revolution. It's been a social revolution where homosexuality is now a preferred, according to the mainstream media, it's a preferred lifestyle. It is a quote-unquote natural form of birth control. And the activists that were involved were involved with uh, uh, blood terrorism. I know that many cities were threatened, and folks, you don't hear this in the mainstream news, but we have put it out for years. They were terrorized with, if you don't bow to our agenda, we're going to come in and mass donate blood into your blood banks and destroy your blood supply. We're talking about HIV tainted blood. Oh, yes, indeed. And in fact, the promotion of homosexuality is part of the war against Christianity because Christianity is a religion which promotes the family unit. And of course, the promotion of homosexuality is war against the family unit and Christianity. Agreed. And, and yet, in their blindness, in their lack of uh, clear sight as to what's really going on, they don't recognize that this is the same old agenda. Folks, AIDS is curable. Uh, just about any ailment known to mankind is curable. And yet, the mainstream medical community, because they help promote the concept of homosexuality as a preferable or superior lifestyle, the homosexuals accept that as a given and they don't look and see what is happening to their ranks because, quite frankly, just like the French Revolution, just like the Night of the Long Knives in Germany, the implementers of the most radical social revolution then fall under the knife. The homosexuals do. It devours its own. Yep, and, and they're rotting. Their bodies are rotting, folks. This is not a good thing. Understand that because uh, I would rather see people turn around. I'd rather see them come to a knowledge of the saving grace of the Most High God. But the fact is, folks, is that as they turn their back, 
their bodies turn black with plague, with, with the plagues that they bring on themselves just through the very lifestyle itself, let alone some virus or bacteria that may or may not be helping further uh, facilitate the uh, horrible destruction that they face in their lives. Well, let's get to our next caller. And uh, by the way, if you'd like to call in, folks, we've got an open line or two, 800-259-5791, 800-259-5791. We know you're out there. Come join us on the air. Let's get to Ken in Virginia. Good evening, Ken. Uh, good evening, Bill. I want to compliment you on having your uh, guest, who is who is one of the amazing uh, resources of, of American, uh, not only history, politics, and, and learning. And uh, I wasn't sure when when uh, you were discussing the chapters. Is this from a new book that he has written? The when he wrote oh, outlining the chapters, or is this uh, chapter ten and so forth? Because I got in, uh, uh, I started, I didn't hear the beginning of the program, uh, and I, uh, you were discussing the, the Civil War briefly, and, and your, your uh, uh, Eustace is, is uh, too modest. He, he, knows, <laughs> he knows he knows the way I am, but uh, he is too modest in his, uh, his speech, uh, and I was uh, think on the C Civil War, the, uh, the two uh, uh, Rothschild agents, which he's talked about so many times, where you had August Belmont in the north, and uh, and and you and you had uh, 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 Judah Benjamin in the south, who was the Secretary of State. And of course, nothing ever happened to him after the war. He oh, uh, he, he went, went back, back to England to and lived up to ripe old age. Where they put Jefferson Davis, the president of the Confederacy, in prison, but Judah Benjamin sailed off to England and lived happily ever after. And, and the, the amusing thing that I, I just recently re read about August Belmont was that he, I, which I didn't know, of, as well as, of course, being very, uh, getting a lot of money from the Rothschilds and, and use, use, uh, utilizing it to, uh, in uh, help, helping lend money to, uh, the, to the North for, for uh, building war, war stuff, that he was interested in, in racing, and that's where we got Belmont Park from. Oh, yeah, and, he was uh, a famous uh, race horse. And so, of course, that, 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 that's sort of entertaining because everybody knows about Belmont Park, but hardly oh, yeah. anybody knows about August Belmont and what he, what he really was. Well, he openly advertised in all the financial records of that time as that he was the American representative of the Rothschilds, but he failed to tell his uh, customers that the Rothschilds also had two other major representatives who were secret, and that was J.P. Morgan Company and Kuhn Loeb Company in New York. Uh, J.P. Morgan was for the Gentiles, and Kuhn Loeb was an all-Jewish company, and so if you were Jewish or Gentile, you still dealt with the Rothschilds through these secret representatives, and August Belmont was the only one who ever identified himself as the actual agent of the Rothschilds. Now, what was this, getting back to my original question, were, were you discussing, uh, uh, is this a new book? Uh, uh, no, uh, Curse of Canaan was published in 1987, oh, uh -huh. but it's okay. just as timely right now as when it was first published. Yeah, I see, okay. Well, now, well, well the facts have changed. Well, yeah, well, and, 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 and let me interrupt for a second, Ken. I find it a very foundational book because it gives a, a pretty good layout of the manipulation of this nation and other nations. And then I, I kind of see a lot of other stuff fitting in and linking in with it from there. But if you don't know who the conspirators are and you don't have a thread that is is going between the different fabrics of delusionment and, and uh, the veils of deception that they put up, then it's really hard to understand how one single entity like the Federal Reserve or the IRS or... Uh, uh, our military is managing to mess us over so bad. I do believe that the outline and the format of Curse of Canaan is really important. I see it as a real foundational book, Eustace. Uh, Ken, back to you. Yeah, I'll get, I'll get, I'll get off. It's, it is a wonderful book, and all, all the others are, too. And uh, Eustace, uh, I mean, we, we just can't repay the debt that uh, we own for, for his wonderful work. I'll, I'll get off the line. All yeah. right, thanks, thanks a lot. Bye. Uh, now, why... I've got two things. Uh, first, first of all, board. I missed the name of the caller from Utah. You can tell me any time. Okay. And second, and and is my board up good or what? I already know. Uh, second, uh, here's an interesting statement from a man. He doesn't have a question here, but I'd like to read this if I could, Eustace. 
He said the first bank of the United States, uh, Andrew Jackson did not renew the charter. It well, that, was second, that was the second bank of the United States. first okay. bank of the United States was not renewed by Thomas Jefferson, and the second one in 1836 was not renewed. Uh, well, uh, what Andrew Jackson did, he said, you are vipers and I will drive you out. And so he removed the government deposits from the Second Bank of the United States, and that caused it to collapse because they were using the government money to, to operate their bank. Mm. And then that brought on the Panic of 1837 by the Bank of England, which refused to honor any American paper anywhere in the world, and that caused the, the first great financial panic in the United States, the Panic of 1837. Mm. Uh, followed up uh, nearly a century later with the second one, the great oh. stock market. Uh, oh, oh, yes. Uh -huh. Well, okay. that set the pattern for the panics that followed later. They, they learned how to do it in the Panic of 1837. And yeah, the Rothschilds themselves then, after the panic in the United States, they sent in their representatives to buy up all the stocks of American companies at one cent on the dollar, and they created a whole new class of millionaires who were Rothschilds agents, and they were the most most powerful people in the United States after 1837. Okay, I'm not going to get into the, the guy's whole question here uh, because I'm going to address that on a later show with my dear friend Greg Pappas. But uh, coming up very soon, folks. But uh, I've got a question for you. Now, I was told by the grandson of Adonai Rothschild in a meeting that we had a number of years ago, he said, you guys always follow the men. He said, what you don't follow is where the women, where the Rothschild women end up. And he said, that is a trail that I think you'll find most worthy. If oh, yeah, that's very important. Yeah, now, now I, I have not read all your books, uh, but do, do you introduce that factor at all? Because, again, you know, I, I do find that relevant. We do keep an eye on the males, but the women, again, they give those ties and links. Uh, into the agenda just through their bloodline as they marry males from other uh, lines. Oh, yeah. One of, one of the uh, leaders of a British uh, foreign office for, for, in the 19th century was Lord Rosebery, who married Hannah Rothschild. And the Roseberries are uh, supposedly a Gentile family, but it's a Rothschild uh, relation. That's interesting. Oh, you know, it's almost as if they marry off the women to achieve either political or financial conquest to spread the Rothschild empire. Well, they do because, you see, the Rothschilds would never allow uh, a female member to be a partner of the Rothschild banking house, but the women married uh, very prominent uh, aristocrats in England and uh, became powerful that way. And that's interesting, folks, because... We know the British East India Company was involved not just in opium, but slave trade. And who runs the British East India Company, uh, Houston? Oh, that's the Rothschild Houston. operation. Yeah, that's the Rothschild operation. Folks, the point about this is not only were they trading in slaves, not only were they trading in strange flesh, flesh that was not their bloodline, but through the marriage of the women, they were trading in flesh through their own family. In my opinion, that is a completely depraved mentality. Oh, it certainly is. All right. Well, let's get to our next caller, and that is Rose in Utah. Good evening, Rose. Hi there. Uh, speaking of the women, do either of you know when the uh, modern-day so-called Jews started tracing their bloodline through the women, since clearly in the Bible it's through the men? Yes. Do you know when they oh, started that? I don't know that? exactly when that started, but I think it started after 1700 when the... Uh, uh, Freemasons became uh, very powerful in England, and England was the leading world power at that time. Well, and, and I, think I think it has to be a modern invention, because yes, it's it certainly not definitely. biblical. Yes. If I can offer one up too, Rose, um, a great Pappas will have some insight on that when he comes up, I believe, this next week. But I might throw this out. Due to the complete history... That uh, and there was some very good history and very good records. And now, due to the printing press and other things, more of this history became available. It may be that they made this switch by chasing, by by uh, you know bringing the women as the relevant factor on tracing the bloodline. Because the fact is, is that in 70 A.D., I believe the entire Levitical priesthood was wiped out in Jerusalem, mm -hmm. meaning there was never a chance again 
for the temple sacrifices to be performed, meaning that unless Messiah had already come, the Jews never had any hope again. Well, they certainly don't have the sacrifices today, do they? No, no, they don't, and they can't righteously revive them because, again, the Levitical priesthood, I believe, was wiped out. Well, what's your thoughts on that, Houston? You I believe that, too, I, I, because uh, that was a very powerful uh, 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 force against the uh, uh, Jews at that time. Well, and, and I know I'm, I'm quite frankly speculating on that, but it does seem, you know, with the invention of the Gutenberg, uh, uh, I mean, with the printing press and uh, all the things that came out of that, now all of a sudden more text, more information is available to the regular public in order to defer and defray away from certain things like finding out that uh, the belief system of modern Judaism can never come to fulfillment without Messiah already having returned. He already would have had to return. Uh, they would lose their power. They would lose so much of their control because all their priests were dead. The, the priests, the temple priests, they were the Levites. If the Le Levitical line was wiped out at that point, well then the only way you can try and work around that is through the women. Well, I figured the women thing had something to do with the money thing, but I can't figure it out exactly how that works. You know, keeping the power uh, in, the, in the group. You mean kind of a checks and balances thing? Yeah. Uh, I want to tell you, you know that horrible uh, suicide bombing they had at the, at the disco where the young people were killed? Oh, yes. Three of those young people, although they were Jews, could not be buried on Jewish soil, on public soil, because they weren't Jewish enough. Yeah, you know and, what I mean? And, Their mothers weren't Jewish. And are we talking of a belief system or are we talking of a race, folks? You can't have it both ways. Hang on, Rose. We'll be back for the close right after this. Seems like we just started, Eustis. Well, maybe except for you. You're out there on the East Coast time zone, so I know it's awful late for you. But uh, I, I thoroughly have enjoyed you being up tonight. And again, that offer every Friday night until uh, you are weary of being on my show, and I pray that doesn't happen anytime soon. I'd like to have you up. So you've got that thought filled as long as you desire, sir. Well, thank you very much. Okay, Rose, are you still with us? Yes. Uh, that zip code, was it 24401? Yes, that's the code. Okay, and let me ask you the about the Federal Reserve. The different presidents appoint those seven uh, board members at different times. Do they get a short list of who to appoint? Uh, can they appoint a, a taxi cab driver? What are the qualifications? No, no, they have to be, bank, uh, they have to be important bankers. Uh, out of Wall Street or a Wall Street connection, and uh, the president himself, of course, doesn't know any of these people. They are recommended. To, the names are given to him by the bankers themselves. He has uh, absolutely no choice whatsoever. Was Alan Greenspan a banker? Uh, he was a partner at J.P. Morgan. Oh, okay, a partner. <laughs> okay, so really, each president, when they say, "Oh, the president appoints the chairman of the Fed," he has he has only seven choices, right? That's right, and yet they say that the Federal Reserve System is independent. They always talk about the independence of the Federal Reserve System. Uh, they're independent of the American people, but they're not independent of the bankers. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Well, thank you very much. Yes, indeed. Well, you're welcome, Rose. Okay. And, folks, for those of you who are going to catch the show on the archive, uh, once again, I'd like uh, Eustace to give out the information where you can reach him and order some of his fine books. And, again, tonight's interview was based on the curse of Canaan. Uh, yes, well, it's the Bankers Research Institute, which is at uh, PO Box 1105, Stanton, Virginia, 24401. Okay, and, and what does Curse of Canaan cost? Isn't it $15? $15. That's a deluxe hardcover book. As all your book, all your books are hardcovers, aren't they? Yes, indeed they are, yes. Oh. Because... Uh, 
due to the improvement in printing, I found a few years ago that I could print hardcovers for practically the same price as paperbacks because I have kept my prices low over the years because I want as many people as possible to get these books. Well, we sure do appreciate it. And, you know, you just, I do believe the time is coming where educational resources are going to finally be recognized as being much more of value than having a good supply of bullets. Oh, which, definitely. Uh, which I don't think is a bad idea either. But <laughs> the fact is it's a weapon that gets greater through the giving. Folks, that's true. That's the nature of Christ. It's the only gift that gets greater through the giving, and you can't ever exhaust it. Believe me, folks, you can run out of bullets. I think these resources may be here during a time when things get very dark for this nation, and you'll find, folks, that you'd be more willing to lay your life down to protect and disseminate, inform disseminate information like this than even, even to hold on to your weapons. So, um, Eustace, I want to thank you for joining us, my friend, and uh, let's give it a talk uh, sometime next week and discuss uh, what we're going to go over on next Friday's show. Okay, my friend? I'll be looking forward to it. All right. Thanks, Eustace. God bless. Thank you.